job the most. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, you can be seated. That's great. I'm glad that uh, we're a community that has relationships. Relationships are one of the key factors in our life, and we're going to talk about that. You know, we've taken hold of some thorny issues in this five-week series, busyness, parenting, finances, disappointment, and these issues are ones that keep us under pressure. I mean, sometimes you feel like you're under so much pressure that just one more thing and you just feel like you're going to blow. I mean, the whole thing's going to blow up. But perhaps the biggest pressure on your life, the one that is involved in all of those other pressures, really, is when you're in conflict with someone. I mean, relationship conflicts just wear you down. They eat on your conscience. They rip the joy out of your life. You know, everything else in your life can be going great. But if one major relationship is out of sync, out of sorts, a big conflict, everything else seems bad. It feels like it's all a mess. It could be work. Maybe you've got a coworker, a boss, an employee. It could be with your family, with your spouse. If it's with your spouse, I mean, everything feels bad. Perhaps your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. Uh, everything at work may be great, but coming home, and it's a shouting match. Or it's the silent treatment. I mean, nobody's backing down. Nobody's trying to resolve it. You just hope it will all go away. In fact, I heard just last night uh, that, that there's a new study that reveals that people feel more stress at home than they do at work. And we know we probably feel a lot of stress there, too. We, relationships can affect all of your life. And relationships really are the best of times and, you know, they're the worst of times, too. They have the potential to be amazing or atrocious. And as I talk with people, many of us seem to have somebody in our lives who was at one time extremely important to us who we're not speaking to. Often it's an adult son or a daughter or a brother or a sister, a mother or a father. In fact, I had some people talk to me after the service about somebody that they were out of sorts with because of something. I mean, maybe it's a best friend at school, someone that you ought to feel close to that you feel totally cut off from now. Maybe it's all your fault. Highly unlikely, I know. Maybe it's all their fault, of course. But, but usually there's enough blame to go around to both of us. Now, there are lots of relationship conflicts in the Bible. It starts out not far from the very beginning of the Bible with Adam and Eve. You know, when God confronts Adam about violating the only command that God had given them, not to eat of the fruit of one single tree, Adam blames it on his wife. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit and I ate it. And the woman blames the serpent, and the blame game that has started uh, hasn't stopped since. And when you throw your responsibility on somebody else, especially in front of God, it's going to cause conflict. And we don't know what kind of fight Adam and Eve had after that, but you can bet it was a doozy, right? Uh, I'll bet it was something Eve brought up a few times later when she was in a tiff with Adam, too. Well, remember, remember the time that you tried to throw me under the bus with God? Now, I'm just making that up because uh, there's not much else in the Bible, really, about Adam and Eve, except that they had a number of children. But it doesn't seem like they did a very good job of teaching their children to deal with conflict either. Because when their oldest son does the wrong thing, and the younger son does the right thing before God, the older brother is jealous, and he takes out his anger on the younger brother in the most extreme way possible. Cain said to his brother, let's go out in the field. Sounds innocent enough. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. I mean, wow. That's how Cain dealt with conflict. There were only four people on earth, and Cain's jealousy of his own brother consumes him so much that he 
uh, resorts to murder. And then there were three. And God spared Cain, but sent him out of his presence east of Eden, away from that perfect garden of innocence. And, and all of us now live east of Eden because of our sin. And conflicts, not just difficulties, not just differences, but conflicts are normal now. It's where we live. Now, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. We don't know how many, but, but one of them probably became Cain's wife, and they had children, and their children had children. And before long, Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech, married two women. And the Bible doesn't tell us, but there had to be a lot of conflict in that household. Those of us who are married know that one man and one woman is probably enough uh, possibility of conflict without adding a third wheel to the picture. And Lamech reveals something to his wives, and it's just kind of barely in Scripture there, but he says that he, like Cain, has also killed a young man. And before long, the world... The, the Lord saw that the world was so evil, there was so much wickedness, there was so much conflict with God and no doubt each other as well that God wanted to do over. And, and he decided to save just one blameless man, Noah, and his family, and a sampling of the animal creation and start life all over again. But even after they started over, there was plenty of conflict very soon. And conflict soon magnified so much that the, the conflict wasn't just between individuals. It was actually between groups of people as well. And they didn't know how to handle it, I guess. And so they turned to violence, war, people killing people over disagreements about uh, land and water rights and, and money and, and sex and, and there was jealousy and, and conflict when not handled carefully is disastrous for relationships and it's disastrous even for human life itself. Now, let's make a couple of things clear about conflict before we go on. First of all, conflict in itself is not inherently wrong. Whenever you have two people from two different backgrounds, from two different, they, you have two different thoughts, you have different feelings, different styles, different habits, different personalities. And some of those ideas, some of those behaviors, you know, you know, they're going to lead to conflict. Conflict is just a fact of life now. But it's how you deal with conflict that makes the difference as to whether there becomes a breach in the relationship, as to whether it leads to sin, whether it leads to pain, whether it leads to hurt. So conflict is inevitable. It, it, it just is. It's inevitable. Now, I don't think anybody much really wants to be in conflict in relationship. I guess there are some people who just love a fight, but most of us don't want conflict. We want peaceful relationships. We want life to be simple and easy and everybody happy. And it would be if people would just do what I wanted, if they would just agree with me. Wouldn't it be easy? Now, many of us go to one extreme and we avoid conflict at all costs. And of course, avoiding conflict does have a cost. And when we avoid conflict that should be dealt with honestly, we hold in a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings. And it usually goes one of two ways. One way some people call gunny sacking. Now, if you don't know about gunny sacks, they're just a burlap bag which were used to carry potatoes or grain or, or something else. But if you keep potatoes in a gunny sack for a long time, you never eat them, they get rotten. And eventually the gunny sack rots and it makes a huge mess when you pick it up. And that's what happens when you keep stuffing down your feelings, your grievances, your irritations. And, and over time, those feelings start to rot. Maybe they were even rotten when you put them in there. I don't know. And, and you become more and more full of rotten stuff. And, and when someone says something that you disagree with, usually somebody close to you, your wife, your husband, somebody at work, your gunny sack bursts open, and there's a nasty, smelly mess all over. And people are wondering, where did that come from? Well, it came from the gunny sack that you're carrying around full of those conflicts and feelings and things that you never did sort out. 
Now, the other way that many people deal with conflict is a term I just made up called garbage canning. Now, I don't know what it's really called. In garbage canning, you're so conflict averse, just like uh, gunny sacking, but you're so afraid of conflict that you stuff your feelings not in a gunny sack that could burst, but in a strong metal garbage can with a very tight lid. And you blame every conflict, not on the other person, but you blame it on yourself. And you stuff all your feelings in the can, you slam the lid on as fast as you can. And that often leads to depression. Depression has actually been called anger with a lid on it. Anger put inside with a lid on it so you can't get it out. It's still there, but it has no healthy way out, and and conflict never gets solved. And those feelings that you've kept so carefully out of sight that nobody knows about uh, are still getting more rotten every day. But now the issue is far bigger far bigger than it would have been if you dealt with them one at a time. Max Lucado said it well, conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. Now, those who avoid conflict at all costs don't get into combat, but they do something just as negative as the combat. They hurt themselves or they end up hurting somebody else. Now, if all you care about is getting your own way, then combat will often, always follow conflict. It doesn't take too much to turn a perfectly normal and understandable conflict into combat. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you want to learn to deal with conflict differently. You want to deal with it in a way that's non-sinful, a way that respects both you and also other persons involved. Now, I can't give you all of the answers today uh, on how to deal with conflict, mainly because I don't know all the answers, but, but there is a little book in the back of your New Testament called James, and it has something to say about conflict that turns into combat. Now, James, if, if you've read it, you know he likes to get at the root of things, and he's so straight, he's so straightforward that many of us love to read that book because we see ourselves in there. So James just starts out chapter 4 with a big question. What causes fights and quarrels among you? I mean, don't, don't look at the answer yet, but that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, think about that question for a moment. Think about somebody that you're in conflict with now. Maybe it's somebody that you're not talking to. Maybe there's a significant disagreement with somebody. And ask yourself, why are we in conflict? I mean, what's the cause? Now, of course, your first answer may be like mine. Well, if he would just or if she would just, I mean, it's all their fault. But go deeper than your gut reaction. If it takes two to fight, what's your side of the conflict? I mean, what's behind this? Why is this a conflict issue for me? Why am I willing to go to war over this? Or why do I feel so strongly and so afraid that I'm willing to stuff it into my gunny sack or my garbage can? And here's James' answer, but I don't know if you're going to like this answer. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? That is, the battle starts inside, and then it comes outside. You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, and you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may just spend what you get on your pleasures. You're you're, you're really not trying to sort it out. You're just trying to avoid it in a different way. So what causes relationship conflicts? Well, James is clear. He says it's the battles that we have, the desires battling within us. And you want something, but you don't get it. You want your wife to agree with you, but she doesn't. You want your husband to pick up his socks, but he doesn't. You want your child to obey cheerfully, but she doesn't. You want your brother to stop embarrassing you, but he doesn't. You want your husband to quit spending money that you don't have, but he doesn't. You want your wife to get a better job, but she doesn't. 
And I think it all boils down to one word, and, and I warn you, you're definitely not going to like this word. You're going to resist thinking about this every time you're in conflict, but here it is, selfishness, selfishness. I mean, conflicts have their root in selfishness. The desires that battle within you. You want it your way, way, he wants it his way. Our group wants it this way. Your group wants it the other way. Republicans want the right way. Democrats want the left way. (laughs) Some conflicts are over principle. And there's a clear right and wrong. But most conflicts seem to be based on I want it my way, right? Selfishness. I mean, it it turns people into enemies. It it causes families to break up. It splits churches. It causes fathers to abandon their children. It causes mothers to ignore their children and just do their own thing. And most relationships probably bring out our selfishness somewhere. I mean, they just do because it's in us. I, I wonder, I wonder if that's one of the reasons God designed marriage. Because it sure does bring out our selfishness, doesn't it? It sure brings out what I want to do and what that other person wants to do. And living as a family brings out selfishness. You know, kids fighting over over the game controller, parents arguing over the TV channel, grandma complaining about all the noise. Conflict at work. You want something, but you don't get it. Guess what? Probably selfishness. Conflicts in school. My friend said something, then I don't like it, and I'm not speaking to them ever again. Probably selfishness. And that's where sin comes in. It's not just the differences that being human, but from the selfishness that being sinful brings. And God wants you to see your selfishness. He wants to know you to know it, and that's why if you're in a relationship and it brings it out, great, celebrate. Not too much, but celebrate, you know, because now you can see it. Now you can start allowing God to uproot it from your life. He wants you and me to grow out of selfishness into humility. C.S. Lewis writes this, uh, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Do you get it? it's not to put you down. That's not what God wants. God wants to lift you up. But he doesn't want you always thinking about yourself, your own needs, all of those things. And that's true selflessness as well. Now, I know it's oversimplified, but wouldn't you agree that uh, selfishness is the root of a lot of conflicts? But if selfishness is the cause of conflicts, I mean, we get that, but what keeps conflicts going? And going and going. I mean, why does a little thing turn into a huge monster problem in a minute? I mean, why when somebody disagrees with some little thing in the church, do they end up leaving the church over it? Why does a couple who says that they would love one another until death end up hating one another until death? I mean, this may be oversimplifying again, but but what keeps conflict going is a word that I think you must not forget. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. I mean, lack of forgiveness is a poison that turns a conflict into a long-term fight. And when you determine not to let a slight go, when you determine to hang on to a hurt, when you nurse a hurt into a big wound, and a little conflict turns into bitterness or stonewalling or revenge. And then on the other end, when somebody knows that they've done wrong and refuses to admit it, when somebody refuses to repent and ask for forgiveness, the second sin compounds the next one. They compound. You know, you, you have the conflict caused by selfishness and then the unforgiveness just makes it grow. And on on the other end, we have to remember what Paul writes. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Jesus said, so watch yourself. Watch yourself. Do you ever watch yourself? 
If your brother sins, rebuke him. It's okay to confront somebody if you, if you need to do that to help them. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, I was wrong, don't forgive him. Oh, wait, wait, no, no. Forgive him. That's the idea. And of course, Jesus' example shows us that we may not just repent, uh, forgive those who actually repent, but those who hurt you badly and never repent. When evil men condemned Jesus to death, beat him almost to death, and finally crucified him, he said, Father, forgive those people. They don't get it. They don't understand. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus didn't just stuff his feelings down. He actually did something positive with it. He forgave. Now, Paul gives us some overarching principles on how to overcome conflict with somebody who may begin to feel like your enemy. There, there may be people out there that you were close to or you feel like you should be close to or just somebody you come in contact with that, that somehow now feels like your enemy. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, don't repay. Don't repay evil for evil. And be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to revenge, to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, do the thing you least want to do. Feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, first, we ha we're called to do something we don't want to do. It doesn't even seem natural. He says, don't repay evil for evil. No revenge. Now, an immediate reaction for many of us when we're hurt is to hurt the other person back. I mean, we want them to feel our pain, right? I mean, we want them to know how bad it hurts, so... Getting back, even with them, would really be cool. Not. Arguments ensue when you try to get back at someone with the same forceful words that they've attacked you. When I was younger, you know, my sisters and I used to get in a few fights. And I, uh, not always physical, but I, I like to hit my sister now and then, yeah. But they always hit me back with double the force that I hit them. They were twice as, they were older than I was. So if you escalate the volume and intensify the force of your words, it doesn't really help. And if you're following Jesus, you determine to let go of that. You know that God is the, the only one who's qualified to, to mete out any revenge. You don't know how to do it. You don't know how to do it fairly, so why try at all? And if anyone is going to even out things, let the one who knows how to do things just and right. But not only do we refuse to get involved in the evil for evil, tit for tat game, we do something positive. Do overcome evil with good. Do overcome evil. It may not appear so, but goodness is far more powerful than evil. And in, in those tough conflicts over ideas, in those times that you disagree intently with somebody, in those times someone seems to deliberately hurt you, step out with the power of God and use good instead of using the same thing that they gave to you. It's amazing what a little kindness can do. You know, when you loan your help to the person who just cut you down, you're overcoming evil with good. When you step back from a quarrel over words, and you know that there's, there's a higher value than winning the argument, good overcomes evil. When you have a far better idea as you always do, by the way. And you know you're headed for conflict, conflict but you choose to see, see the value of the relationship over your idea, you're overcoming evil with good. So if in doubt, do what everybody knows is right, is what Paul says. I mean, there are principles that are universally accepted, at least generally are, and you know what they are. You don't need somebody to tell you. It may not be what you feel at the moment, but use those principles of love and mercy and grace and truth. Do, do the, the thing you know 
is right. And then fourthly, do everything possible from your end to make peace. Do everything you can to make peace. Paul writes, if it's possible, not always, as far as it depends on you, because you can't control what the other person does, live at peace with everybody. Uh, peace doesn't all depend on you, but there's a lot that you can do. And often people try to make peace once and they don't get a very good response and they say, I give up. That's it. I'm not going to speak to them again. No, no. Value the relationship. Do everything, everything, everything you can to make peace with somebody. Try and try again whenever you can. Now, there are some relationships you can't do anything about. And I certainly want to urge you, I, I don't want to urge you to put yourself in a vulnerable position with somebody who is seriously abusing you. Some of you may be in situations where somebody has abused you. You say, well, I got to make peace with that. That may not be the right thing to do in that situation. That may not be healthy. But do what you can to make peace in every situation that you can even if it's peace from a distance. You're not responsible for the outcome, but you are responsible for your attitudes and for your actions. Fifthly, do realize the consequences of conflict. You must remember, Satan wants to take you down. He does. He wants evil to overcome you. He wants you to think that winning the argument Putting the other person down, never speaking again, is the best thing you can do. After all, you're right. But being right is overrated. Do you know that? Being right's overrated. I mean, okay, we want to be right on the big things. But sometimes I want to be right all the time. We got to let that go. A little thing can fester and brew and grow way out of proportion, and you can lose a valuable relationship, which is bad enough. But the consequences are bigger than losing a friend if you let evil overcome you. Because one practice starts another practice, starts another practice, and it just keeps going on in your life. Now, here are a few other ideas. Uh, not all of these are directly from the Bible. But do work on the problem, not the person. You know, I talk with uh, people all the time and ask them, well, what's the problem? And they say, it's him. It's her. You know, she's the problem. Of course. Of course, that's what we think. But let's work on the problem. The problem is not the person. Let's separate the problem from the person so that we can work on that. Also, do let go of history. Now, some people like to come, uh, some people like to come to you and they say, you know, I know that you'd like to know all the things that are wrong with you. And I just made this little list here. <laughs> and, and I've just got a few things. I know you'll be open to this and the whole thing. No, no, you got to let go of history because that destroys relationships. And most of us love to bring up the history. Back in 1999, you did do you remember? I remember. I won't forget when you did this. I've done that with my wife more than a few times. Not a good idea. Not helpful. And here's what couples say when they get in an argument. You always, you never, never say never. You know, never say always. Talk about the current situation. Leave your history in the dust of the past and start fresh. Eighth little point here is do deal with conflicts quickly. Paul writes something about anger that we must all remember because anger has a lot of relationship and conflict. I mean, a lot of problems in conflict deal with anger. In your anger, you may have it, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, anger in itself is not always wrong. There is righteous anger. There were things Jesus was angry about. There are things you should be angry about. When we hear of 200 schoolgirls being kidnapped in Nigeria, there would be something wrong if we weren't angry. But don't sin. 
in your anger. And most human anger has some sin in it somewhere, or it will get there soon. Rarely is it totally righteous anger. But anger, if expressed, must express itself in non-sinful ways. And most of our anger in relationships is not expressed in that way. It's steeped in selfishness, it's allowed to grow, and then resentment along with its sister bitterness adds to the sin. Paul says, use this rule. It's a good rule. Don't go to bed angry. Just don't go to bed angry. Now, some of you are going to have to stay up all night, right? Maybe all the next day too, but, but don't go to bed angry. And what he's saying is settle your conflicts quickly. If you wait, you know you know, it just gets worse. And if you need a little time to cool down, as some of us do, okay. Take the time, but say, all right, I'll talk to you in an hour. I'll talk to you in two hours. I'll, you know, I want to sort this out as well. And also be the first to apologize. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing if you were in a relationship and both, both of you were the first to apologize? In our marriage, uh, Ricky is usually the first, I have to admit it. I'm slower, but I'm learning. We've got to apologize quickly and, and genuinely. And also, don't give the devil a foothold. The devil's foot in the door is worse than a salesman's foot in the door. And sustained anger shoves the devil's big foot in the door. It just does. And if you give him a foot, you know what he'll take? A mile or two or maybe a hundred. You know, he's going to change you. He's going to do something. If he gets something little in there, you've got to deal with the little things. Now, conflict's not all bad. Conflict has some value because it has some benefit to us. So remember, God wants to refine you through conflict. Conflict actually helps. As iron sharpens iron, so the proverb says, one man, one man and woman, one woman and woman actually sharpen one another. Sometimes sparks have to fly for a relationship to get better and for you to get sharper. So sharpen one another through your differences, through the conflicts that come. Here's four quick things under that. Conflicts helps you realize the value of the relationship. You realize, look, this disagreement is just not worth damaging our friendship. It's not worth hurting our marriage. It's not worth uh, our working relationship getting out of sorts. It's not worth hurting our church over. Secondly, conflict helps us realize our own lack of perfection. <laughs> We're not always right. That's a hard one for some of us to admit. Thirdly, conflict helps you develop understanding and patience. You see the other person's point of view. That's really helpful. And conflict also brings you to a better solution. A better solution. I mean, it's really true that two heads are often better than one, but not when they're two hard heads. That doesn't help. Now, let me close with just one of the many examples of conflict in the Bible. It's a conflict between two powerful uh, friends, two powerful Christian co-workers, Paul and Barnabas. Now, when everybody was skeptical about Paul's conversion because he'd been killing Christians, and now he says he's a follower of Jesus, Barnabas is the one who steps up and says, I believe you. And he took him to the apostles and says, here's this guy's testimony. It's incredible. <clears throat> He's turned around. He's safe now. You can believe this man. And Barnabas' name actually means son of encouragement. Bar means son, son of encouragement. And he lived up to his name. Maybe it was a nickname. We don't know for sure. Now, Paul and Barnabas went out on their first missionary trip together, and they decided to expand their team with a fellow we know as Mark. But halfway through the journey, Mark left them and went home. And this did not go down well with Paul. And here's the story from Acts 15, verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Hey, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul didn't think it was wise to, to take him because he deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. 
And they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. I mean, that's strong. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And so Barnabas, the great encourager, and Paul, the man who wrote the greatest love chapter in the world, disagreed with one another so strongly they could not even work together. These lions of faith, these great partners in ministry, didn't settle their conflict. They gave up on each other and split. And you can imagine Paul saying, you know, we're not taking Mark this time. We were counting on him before. He blew it. He let us down. No way is he going with us. And Barnabas says, you know, he just needs another chance. You know, he was young. He, he was just homesick. And Paul says, you know, you're just saying that because he's your cousin. And Barnabas, he's matured. Come on, he'll be okay this time. He's a good helper for the ministry. You're too optimistic, Barney. I mean, you always see through those rose-colored glasses. You never see reality. You're too black and white, Paul. You think you're always right. You never give people another chance. And I don't, imagine, I don't know what other words they said, but their disagreement was sharp. Maybe there was anger involved. Perhaps they said things they shouldn't have said. And those are the kind of issues in our life that just kind of linger. And they just keep getting bigger. They're the kind of disagreements that cause divorces and cause children to hate their parents and cause partners in ministry to never speak to one another again and cause groups and churches to gang up on one another and split the church. And when you boil down Paul and Barnabas's disagreement, it was just a conflict over perspective. I mean, you and I can look back at it and say, it was no big deal. But they couldn't agree. And perhaps in that circumstance, the best thing they could do was to go in their separate ways. And as always, God did work good out of a bad situation because now they had two missionary teams instead of one. But that's not the best way to multiply ministry. Now, we don't know what happened in the intervening years between Paul and Barnabas, but it looks like they both had good missionary journeys. But somewhere along the line, Mark must have done a good job, and he stuck with us this time. Now, if Barney had said, I told you so, Paul, you know, you're, you were wrong, you're always too hasty to make judgments, it would have just started all over again, just like it does in some of our relationships. But somewhere along the line, there was reconciliation. Because Paul writes later to Timothy, get Mark and bring him with me, bring him with you, because he's helpful to me in my ministry. That's incredible. Mark, the useless deserter, has become a helpful minister of the gospel. And Paul turned around. I don't know if Paul went to Barnabas and said, you know, I'm sorry, Barney. You know, I'm sorry, Mark. I, I was wrong. I don't know if Barney came and begged for reconciliation and asked Paul for forgiveness for, for the things he shouldn't have said. But somehow Paul and Barney's hearts were softened. We don't know how it happened, but we know that eventually they lived out the truth that they preached every day. The truth that was so hard for them to live. But now they were reconciled and they learned to love one another. I have a pastor friend who ended up in the crosshairs of some other church leaders, his, his, his church leaders. They said some very hurtful things to him, and my friend felt he had no other option but to resign his ministry, and they parted company. But he did something that probably most of us wouldn't have done. I'm not sure I would have. He continued to love those people who hurt him. And when he met those who had run him out of the church, he greeted them warmly as the old friends that they were. When the close relative of one of his, uh, one of the friends who had hurt him died, he went to L.A. in order to uh, go to the funeral. He visited their relatives in the hospital. He just kept, kept caring. They had hurt him, but he would not let that damage their relationship as far as it depended on him. And because of that, he restored his relationship completely with the people in that church. And it was all because of the effort of one person. One side of the issue, not the other side. And eventually it paid off. 
Now look, it, it may not always work that way. It, it may not work that way in your relationship, but it's worth a try. It's worth a try because it's the right thing to do. You know, in the end, all your relationships are going to end up as a story. Which story do you want to tell? I refuse to talk with my sister because she... I cannot stand my colleague at work and I'm going to avoid them for the rest of my life. Or do you want to say, you know, I prayed for my friend who froze me out of her life. I took the courage to talk to her and amazingly, we became friends again. Do you want your story to be, I broke the ice after something terrible that my brother did to me and we have a restored relationship. One day your relationships will all be just a story. Which story do you want to tell your children? Which story do you want God to know about you? And will you follow the principles of Christ and just trust him for the outcome? Or will you have to follow your own way of dealing with things, of just being right? Will you allow God to restore your relationship. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you're the God of reconciliation. You reconciled to us all on your own. And while we were yet sinners, you died for us. While we were your enemies, you came and did what we needed. You took the initiative. And Lord, I thank you that you care about us deeply, that you want the best for us. Lord, I, I would guess, just like there were in the earlier service, that some of us here have some steps to take. That there are some people in our lives that we shouldn't be out of sorts with, but we are. That there are some people in our lives that are extremely hard for us to relate to. but you're calling us to be bigger, be stronger in you. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you gave, you stepped out, you did something significant. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.